Hey everyone, welcome. I hope everyone's having a great time at Rails World so far. I can't believe we're already halfway through and I'm pretty excited what, to, uh, what is for lunch today. The salmon yesterday was really good. Um, hopefully you're excited to learn a little bit more about the foundations of what Rails applications are made from, gems. And if you're not excited, I don't really know what to say to you. Get excited. Um, to get us started, raise your hand if you ever have run bundle install before. Okay, great. A lot of people have run bundle install. Then you have probably seen a long list of gems being fetched, installed, or being used on your machine. If you're running bundle install in a Rails application, you can boot it up, run the test, and it's working all fine. Yay, you're on Rails. It's so simple, right? But do you really know what's going on when you run bundle install? How can gems be used right out of the box in a Rails application? These are questions that I was wondering about and wanted to get to the bottom of. Classic example of talk-driven development, eh? Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll get a better understanding on the ins and outs of Ruby dependencies and how they work in Rails. Hi, I'm Jenny. I work at Shopify under the Rails infrastructure team. Uh, I've been mostly focused on working in rubygems.org in the past few years, mostly to help add security features and policies to make our dependency ecosystem more secure. That I'll touch a, a bit more on later in this talk. rubygems.org is the community's gem hosting service security uh, that hosts <laughs> over 175,000 gems. It is also a Rails app where you can view the gems available and the information about each of them. And it provides an API to manage gems. The tool to actually manage these gems is Ruby Gems without the org. Um, it is a package manager, it is bundled with Ruby, and it's, uh, again, yeah, used to manage gems using the gem command. Bundler is also a gem that gets mentioned a lot with Ruby gems. Its main purpose is to resolve and standardize the gems used in a Ruby project across all machines and environments, so um, they all work together well. And fun fact, Bundler and RubyGems lives in the same GitHub repo, even though uh, each uh, separate tool gets released separately. So today, uh, we'll go through how gem installation works under the hood. We'll first go through how gem install works and installing a single gem. Then we'll go through how Bundler tackles installing the correct dependencies for your Rails application. After that, I'll talk through how dependencies work so seamlessly with Rails. We'll be uh, talking a bit about dependency groups, spin stubs, and debugging a gem within a Rails application. And during the last few minutes, I'll share some evil things that can happen when you install gems. Um, if, a, if people want a copy of the slides and references to follow along, feel free to scan this QR code. I'll also have this up at the end of the presentation. Okay, cool, let's get started. How does gem install work? What happens when you run gem install Rails? When you run it, it shows that it installed the most recent version of Rails. This is kind of outdated since Rails.1 came out yesterday, but bear with me. Um, but what is actually happening? Uh, when the command is run, it'll accept the gem name, like Rails, and the version requirements. This could be an actual version, a version range, or um, by default, it'll specify a lower bound if you didn't define a version requirement. Uh, each command that RubyGen supports has a corresponding file in the command's directory with an execute method. The name and the version that gets passed into the command will go through the install gem method. From there, the version will be parsed into a requirement object. This is where if you specify an invalid requirement, RubyGems will yell at you and throw an error saying you did something wrong. 
Uh, it will also initialize something called the dependency installer, which is responsible for installing a gem along with its dependencies. By calling resolve dependencies on the uh, dependency installer with the name and version, it will turn something called the request set. A request set uh, represents the list of uh, gem information or uh, activation requests to determine how to download and install a gem. Um, in resolve dependencies, it parses the gem name and the version into a dependency request. Uh, then a request set will be initialized and uh, the dependency will par be parsed into some sort of set when called resolved um, and uh, that would contain, um, after calling resolve, it will create, it will build the request set with these activation requests. RubyGems currently uses the Millennial Resolver to create a dependency graph to determine what versions of the gem and its dependencies um, that would work. The TLDR for this algorithm, since it's pretty complex, is that given a gem, it'll fetch all of the possibilities available to install based on their requirement. It'll choose the best requirement, uh, usually the most recent one, like uh, Rails 7.08, and add it in to the current state of the dependency graph. And then it will continue to find the possibilities of its dependencies. If there's come a time where there's no possibilities present, we would need to rewind to a state where the conflict can be avoided. And then select the next best version, uh, which is the next latest. To find the version information, the fetcher would uh, retrieve uh, specifications of Rails from the RubyGems index, uh, which is just a separate in that, uh, instance of RubyGems.org to serve this information, and will parse each line um, with the version and the platform at the front, the dependencies of the gem in the middle, and some of the requirements like the Ruby version and all of that. So we're now back at the top level in the install command. We have now have a request set with activation uh, with all of the information needed to install the gems that we need. Now it's actually time to actually download uh, these gems. Um, in install, we're concurrently downloading all the gems from the remote that aren't cached on the machine from the rubygems.org S3 bucket. Each gem is stored as a .gem file with the name and version in the file name. And when a gem maintainer wants to push a new version of the gem, they will run a uh, rake release uh, with the gem spec if they have the bundler gem tasks included. Rake release has two things running, uh, gem build and gem push. Uh, gem build will take the gem spec of the gem that's going to be published, create a tarball file, with the .gem extension. Uh, gem push takes in a .gem file that was built and posts it to the rubygems.org API uh, with the gem. If all things are good, like if it has sufficient permissions, then the file will be written to the S3 bucket. If we download the gem from rubygems.org, uh, we get the .gem file here. We untar it to get a folder with more compressed files. Uh, checksums provide hash values for other files to act as a signal uh, if they're been tampered or corrupted with. And we also uh, store a compressed file of some of the metadata. The data folder actually contains the actual gem contents like the executables included and the libraries. You can also run uh, gem unpack with the gem name and you can easily view the gem contents of a specific gem. So you can see here with active support, once you run gem unpack, it'll create a folder with all of the contents of the gem. Once it receives the binary from the S3 bucket, uh, it'll untar the file, store the data on your machine under the gems folder of your specific Ruby and then it'll store the .gem file in the cache, just in case you want uh, to reinstall at any time. 
and the GenSpec in the specifications folder. Uh, it also installs the executables specified in the spec under the bin directory, so you can run executables easily like Rails New, Rails S, and, and others. To actually use your gem in your Ruby project, you probably have to use require. Uh, this would add the gem path to the load path uh, variable in Ruby, so Ruby can run its code. So for example, if we pull up an IRB uh, and we can't call active supports blank on unused API joins rush shut without requiring it. After we require it, we can see that active supports gem path is now included in the load path variable. A little zoom in there. So yeah, that's kind of gem install in a nutshell. Cool, right? Uh, now that we learned how to go through gem install, how does bundle install work? At the beginning of this presentation, I uh, mentioned that Bundler makes sure that um, all of the gems in a uh, Ruby application stays consistent among all machines. Um, and it does this through something called the gem file. When bundle's install is run, Bundler will create a definition object um, which represents the information in the application's gem file or lock file. It does this by reading, um, does this by reading the gem file and evaluating it like Ruby code. Uh, the gem file is a Ruby DSL, a programming construct used specifically in the context of defining what gems to install. Uh, evaluate will create a DSL instance in the DSL class, which then will call evalgem file as a result. Um, and in evalgem file, um, there's a little line right here that will call instance eval. So this would um, grab the content, content of the gem file and evaluate it in the DSL class. So for example, a uh, common line you see in a gem file is like the gem and the gem name and the version requirements. This actually calls the gem method in the DSL when you run instance eval. So it'll take the name, uh, optional version, and other options uh, as hash arguments, and then it will create dependency objects with them, um, and it will add it to a list. Another method you probably have seen before is the source in a gem file. Um, it's usually uh, rubygems.org. Uh, the DSL uh, would add the string representing the source to the global RubyGem source. It'll throw an error if you try to define more than one. Um, you can also have a source block if you want uh, the gems install, uh, some gems to be installed from another source. The context of this block will override um, the global uh, source for a while, uh, global source um, until the end of the block. And there's a lot of other methods that I won't get into, but hopefully you get a good idea how that works. After the DSL object has built, been built with the dependency sources and all the data, two definition is called, which will accept these values in the initialize a definition object. Um, now we're kind of at part two, installing the definition. Um, resolution is done by the PubGrub dependency resolver. The algorithm was originally created by Nally Weizenbaum uh, for the Dart programming language, which was ported over to Ruby by John Hawthorne. Uh, PubGrub is um, known to be faster than the traditional resolver by introducing something called, um, introducing something called conflict-driven cause learning. Woo. <laughs> but what does that term actually mean? Uh, well, before, when there was a version conflict, Millennia would need to go up the path to find a dependency that won't introduce a conflict. However, it doesn't do a good job in remembering past conflicts. You can hit the same failure path multiple times. 
PubGrub introduces a concept called traits. So this is just a version range of a gem that either works or doesn't work. Um, and they can be used to uh, determine something called incompatibilities. For example, we can see that we need to install a gem cool greater than 1.10 and beans at version 2.0.1 or below at the root. Uh, the initial run through will determine that you cannot install cool uh, less than 1.1 and beans greater than 2.0.1, I can read. Um, when, when going through the dependencies, uh, incompatibilities are tracked so that uh, the versions we know won't work will be avoided. Like we found that <clears throat> picking a version of cool gem, we found that versions above uh, 1.2 uh, requires beans of 2.1 or above. Um, yes, and um, we can create an incompatibility saying that, yeah, we can't, uh, we can't install um, beans greater than 2.0.1 if we're installing cool greater than 1.2.0. Then we can kind of deduce that in general, we can't install the cool gem greater than 1.2.0 because we need beans to be at 2.0.1. That might sound complex because it is, and I tried my best to explain it, um, uh, but you can read more on the reference that I linked um, uh, at the end of the presentation. Since there's so much gem information needed to resolve these uh, dependencies, Bundler uses something called the compact index to retrieve version information. Um, there's quite a few endpoints, but some of them include the version endpoint that would return versions available for all the gems. And uh, what you've seen before with gem install, uh, the info endpoint will give you more information about each gem. They are also cached on your machine um, and up updated if outdated uh, by checking the version of when it was created. Uh, because we're tracking these conflicts using PubGrub, uh, Bundler can give better error messages to help the user actually know what the problem is rather than providing a backtrace-like message and users can just try to update or downgrade some gems. Once that has been figured out, Bundler can download and install all of the resolved gems and generate a new lock file with all the specific versions of the gems um, and its uh, dependencies uh, you want per source, um, the platform, uh, and uh, the dependencies which kind of emulate the, uh, the specifications you put in the gem file and the Ruby version and the bundled with. Cool. Um, we have gotten through, so that is a bit about bundle install. Let's move over to how uh, they work, um, gems work in a Rails application. There are some nifty things that Rails has to manage these uh, dependencies smoothly. The first thing I thought is, um, where are all of the requires in a Rails application? Um, you see them sometimes in like Ruby scripts and all that, but there's none in Rails um, like this. Um, we saw in the application RB of a Rails app, the bundler require method requires all of the gems in the application's gem file based on its groups. So in the gem file, the default group is always included and test uh, staging production gems are included depending on what um, the Rails environment variable is set to. Um, Rails also has something called bin stubs. Um, Might have heard of it before. Uh, bin stubs are executables to help set up your environment to the right version of the gem executable that you want. Um, 
you could do this by running bundle exec Rails S, so that would pick the version of Rails you have in your gem file and run that version. Um, without running bundle exec, it will just use the most recent version on your machine. Um, so instead of using bundle exec Rails S, uh, we use something called bin sub. So that's why people would say, oh, always run bin Rails S and not Rails S. Um, but most of the time it, it works. Um, and the custom bin sub for Rails will include the commands for the current version of Rails that gets installed. Uh, you can generate bin stubs with the bin stubs flag uh, or bundle bin stub. Uh, this a bundler would create a generic bin file to make sure that uh, when you run the binary, it will run the gem executable specified in the gem file and not the most ver uh, recent version on your machine. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is how someone can debug or work with gems in a Rails application. Um, one thing that is fun is bundle show. So this would show the path of the gem that um, the Rails application is using. And one step above that, you can use bundle open to actually open the code on your code editor. So this will open it on VS Code. Uh, you can make the edits that you want and save. And ta-da, your changes will be visible. If your application uses Spring, the gem will probably be cached and you need to stop Spring in order for the Rails application to reload uh, the files with your changes. Um, modifying your gems directly is really simple, but if you don't revert your changes, they might break your code unintentionally in other projects. Um, that has happened to me. Um, gem Pristine uh, is able to reset your gems by reinstalling them to its initial state, but to avoid this from happening at all, um, I like to clone a version and uh, link, it, link, it to the, um, link it to the gem file using the path option. So now that we're a bit more familiar with installing and working with dependencies, it's becoming clear that Bundler and Rails um, makes open, using open source libraries and other people's code so easy. You can add a line to the gem file, run bundle install, and bam, you can run other people's code. However, it isn't all sunshine and rainbows. I'll be touching upon the somewhat evil things um, that can happen in the Ruby ecosystem. Firstly, it's just very easy to install the wrong gem. Say you want to install Rails, but from a simple key slip, you run gem install Rails. Oops. Uh, if you haven't noticed it and run Rails new, you will never gonna give you up, <laughs> never gonna let you down. Never gonna run around and desert you. Never gonna make you cry. Never gonna say goodbye. <laughs> Never gonna tell a lie and hurt you. Well, I did not know this many people will be here, but... <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm not joking. If you run gem install Riles, this will happen, but fortunately you got my voice instead of like your computer voice, so you're welcome. Um, even though Riles is harmless fun, installing the wrong gem might have code to grab application secrets, insert backdoors, anything you can imagine. And fortunately, RubyGems does a few basic checks to mitigate this attack called typo squatting by checking the name of the gems that are being published. If it's similar to a popular gem using Levenstein distance, uh, we would block the publishing of that new gem. And each uh, gem version that does get released, uh, the um, secure there's some tools that does dynamic and static analysis checks to determine that's malicious, if it's malicious. Mache is a part of the RubyGem security team that helps out with a lot of these things, which is great, and he's here at the conference. 
Um, and actually, speaking of him, um, he messaged me this morning about um, another kind of squatting uh, attack. So um, uh, what happens is that a lot of companies, uh, they like to have their pre private gem registries or they would have uh, gems served in GitHub but don't, uh, don't have it on Ruby, don't register the name on rubygems.org. And what that happens, is, what happens is that a lot of, um, there's some scanners that would go through GitHub repositories, see if there's like names that don't, um, that like aren't registered on rubygems.org and then they'll push a malicious version thinking that, um, sometime, at one point, maybe someone would accidentally uh, install the public version. Um, and yesterday at DHH's keynote, he has uh, put a, some gems and um, that I guess are used uh, internally at his company. And uh, there are two gems that did not get reserved. And um, Mache, having a smart mind, uh, was paying attention to this, and he got those two gems reserved on rubygems.org now. So, applause for him. Um, something else that can happen is that gems are pushed by rubygems accounts. These accounts are just like any old account which can be taken over. Um, they can publish a malicious version of a gem, um, like someone getting hold of Raphael's account and publish a malicious version of uh, Rails 7.1 before he can. Luckily, that did not happen, which is great. Um, but securing an account is key. And I, when I mean key, I mean multiple keys. Um, MFA is the best way to prevent account takeover. Uh, we currently require the, the most popular gem maintainers have MFA enabled. And if you want to learn more about how the policy came about, uh, I have a talk up from RubyConf Mini last year. We also introduced WebAuthn support, which is uh, more convenient and secure than the time-based counterparts. So you can use your touch ID or security key when you on the UI and on the command line by providing, by surfacing a custom link to authenticate a, using a security key. Uh, but popular accounts shouldn't be the only ones to have MFA. If you are an owner of an open source gem, please enable it. The community will thank you. Um, Samuel from Ruby Gems also has, is working on the flow to publish gems uh, through CI safely. So um, using something called OIDC, this is great for securely publishing gems automatically through GitHub Actions. Um, it is currently in alpha and is working to be released to the general public. But if you and your company is interested in trying it out and, um, and give feedback, you can email Andre, uh, who is also from rubygems.org, uh, at andre at uh, rubygems.org rubycentral.org. Um, that being said, the RubyGems team is actively working on making sure that the RubyGems ecosystem is stable and safe for everyone to use. Uh, but what does that mean for you? How do you make sure that the gems you're installing are safe to use? Well, you can never be fully safe, but when using gems in a project, less is more. This isn't saying not to use gems at all, but don't have 10 gems in your gem file that do the exact same thing. This will reduce the entry points in which malicious code can enter your system, and it's just way easier to maintain. And is it a reputable gem? Are the maintainers reputable? Do they have MFA enabled? How many users or downloads do the gem, does the gem have? I would rather choose um, the gem Rails with almost half a billion downloads rather than Riles, which has only 14,000. Still pretty popular though. Um, and yeah, 
that's it for now. Hopefully you can take at least one thing on how gem installation, how gem installation works, how they work in a Rails application, and selecting the right gems for your Rails application. Um, and yeah, that's it. Enjoy your lunch. I will be around to answer any questions and be available to chat afterwards. Thank you.